Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, so welcome to UI UX for Startups and how to design an effective landing page. Um, so today we'll be discussing the fundamentals of UI UX, including wireframes, mockups, accessibility, and strategies on how to, um, how to approach designing an effective landing page. Yeah, so firstly, we're happy for Impact, we're a nonprofit RSO at U of I that focuses on making software for nonprofits and other similarly mission-driven organizations. So each semester we partner with four to five nonprofits and build out their tech product either for an internal usage or for their end users or communities that they affect. And yeah, I guess without further ado, we're gonna each introduce myself, but hi, my name is Tiffany and I'm one of the co-directors of Hack for Impact. And Hi, my name is Shrestha. I'm the external director for Hack for Impact. I'm Nikhil. I'm a product designer for Hack for Impact. And I'm Nisha. I'm an academy member in my first year at Hack for Impact. Okay, so first we'll be talking about UI versus UX. So user experience is um, about how the user interacts with the product. So in this case, we're going to be talking about an application. So this involves things like user research because it is important to create personas and establish the target audience and also understand the pain points and goals of a user so that designs can be created appropriately. So this involves things like designing, usability, user flows, user research, interaction design, and wireframes. So Usability is one of the very important aspects of this, um, and it is the extent to support user tasks and goals by making a product satisfying and engaging to use. And it is really achieved when good UI and UX are paired together. So next, user interfaces or UI is the aesthetic design of a product. So this is about the presentation and graphical layout. And this is a also a very creative step. So this involves visual design such as images, buttons, icons, colors, typography, layout, and graphic design. So UI and UX can be thought, thought of through the analogy of skin and skeleton, where UI is the cosmetic appearance and UX is the underlying structure that is to be presented from beginning to end. So this is a simple example of a mobile app design that involves a search bar. So in this example, the first mockup has a search bar, search bar as a button that's in the navigation bar. While in the sec second mockup, uh, the search, there's a search box which is visible on every page in this application. So this layout change in the second mockup makes searching more effortless and this change results in higher searches. So when designing, it is important to think from the user's perspective and how they will interact with the product and also follow design principles. Yeah, so now we'll talk a little bit about wireframes and mockups. So a wireframe is usually a low fidelity, um, a simple sketch using like a digital canvas. Um, it's usually inexpensive and easy to make, um, and you can, you know, write it, draw it on paper or use tools such as Balsamic. Um, and then a mock-up um, is usually high fidelity, includes color, style, um, typography, spacing, those kinds of details. And some online tools that are helpful for this are Figma and Adobe XD. So in the images on the slide, you can kind of see how, like, the wireframe is a more like basic overview of what's going on in the app, and then a mockup has a lot more details about like the visual elements and um, those kinds of details. And moving on to accessibility overall. So accessibility is super important in terms of any website or product that you create just in general, because accessibility helps towards helping anyone experience any sort of product or experience. So a common saying within the disability community is nothing about us without us. So you can't really design for everyone if you're not really designing for everyone and keeping these ideas of universal design in place. So 
th thinking about things such as how disability is not an extreme or edge case. So one in four adults in America have some form of disability, be it visible or not. And because of that, we need to think of all human capabilities as occurring on a scale. So at any point of time too, anyone may have some sort of disability, either get one, such as what if they were to like break their leg or um, all in between on a scale, just as stated. So then another thought too about disability is that disability a lot of times is caused by the environment and people create the environment. So when we're thinking about creating tech products or websites, we need to make them as inclusive as possible for all the different audiences that may interact with it. So in terms of buildings, you can think of the stairs as making the building inaccessible, not the wheelchair. So things such as adding in ramps or elevators are things that also help the majority of the or everyone experience a different kind of landscape or building. But in terms of tech itself, I'm going to focus on that within the next few slides. So equitable design principles in general, or universal design principles, um, are always looking towards different ways that we can make users or allow users to access information in an easier manner, in a quicker manner. So we can rely on principles such as heuristics, which are psychological principles or shortcuts that may that people may take in order to make decisions quicker and making it so that whatever websites or products we create don't require as much effort in order to access them. And this also includes to um, being able to put inclusion at the forefront of whatever product or website you create. And then moving along a little bit from there in terms of tech websites or products, itself um stress if you can click on the next slide yes okay so there are these principles called WCAG so web content and accessibility guidelines and these are geared towards making the web accessible for those with disabilities and a lot of times these guidelines go towards um kind of just elaborating on what exactly is acceptable sizing background text contrast alternate text titles, et cetera, for these websites. So relying on WCAG principles throughout the design of whatever products you're creating, and not just at the end tack on, um, is something that will make whatever you create something that's truly accessible for wide audiences. So in the bottom area, you can see, for example, on the left that the text and fonts on the left side are much harder to read due to the fact that there isn't quite enough contrast between the font or text itself and its background. And because of that, anyone, whether or not they have vision impairments or not, has difficulty reading those. However, if you look on the right side where they're following these principles such as determined by WCAG, then you can more easily read them. And this is actually making it much more universal for everyone to use. All right, so um, I'm Isha and I'm gonna walk you through some different strategies we can use now to improve our designs. Um, so first, it's always a good idea to look at existing solutions to um, use as a reference and also to use to build up your design. Um, and so this is kind of, um, it's interesting on a case by case basis. So you might want to use different kinds of solutions related to what you're working on. If you want a um, product that's implementing navigation, it always helps to look at Google Maps um, and check out the features that you think are especially successful or features that you want to build off of. Um, the same goes for file sharing. You can look at YouTube, you can look at Vimeo, anything that um, kind of deals with the same purpose that you're going for. It's always good to get an inspiration from there and use them as a sounding board. Um, and then I really like this last um, kind of picture for Slack where um, you can kind of take a look at the design that currently exists in different platforms and um, assess what works well in your opinion and what doesn't. So here there's a lot of really good notes that you can uh, kind of bounce off of to basically improve a design that already exists. Um, and so I would say that there's a fine line between uh, making your solution similar to something that already exists or making your solution something that only references an existing solution. So, um, but it's really nice to use them as references. 
All right, and so the next thing that we really um, uh, view as important is uh, five kind of main points of um, any design that you can use to evaluate how well your design is doing. So there's a couple questions that we can ask related to motivation, purpose, um, pain points, demographics, and accessibility. And um, motivation and purpose really just deal with um, what you're trying to produce for people, for users, and why it's important for them. So basically just the what and the why of the situation. Um, and you really want to make a motivation that's catered towards your, uh, your user. So I think that those first two really go in hand in hand. Um, and then from there, um, it's always helpful to deal with pain points, uh, challenges that not your product is going to be facing, but that your users are currently facing um, and always cater to the user. Um, same thing with demographics and then um, what Tiffany just went through with accessibility is also something you can ask yourself um, when you're dealing with your end users. So that's a little bit hard to uh, think about at a, such a high level when you're actually creating an application, um, which is why uh, we actually have a sample prompt that we can take a look at to help contextualize uh, those questions and, um, and help to understand how we would answer those questions. So this simple prompt deals with a software solution to help Americans be less wasteful. And so this is a little bit of a sneak peek into um, the design critique further down this presentation. But for now, if we're thinking about uh, designing a software that makes uh, less waste and kind of champions sustainability, let's ask ourselves some questions related to that. So if we go on to the next slide, um, now we have more specific uh, questions to ask. So about motivation, when you're dealing with something that um, works with sustainability or in the environment, you're always dealing with very like real world issues um, and a lot of very relevant problems. So that's kind of the question, that's in the ballpark of the questions you would ask yourself about motivations. Um, as for purpose, uh, obviously we want to be less wasteful with this design, but you can also get more specific. You can create smart goals for yourself um, have some kind of benchmark, um, attainable goals, uh, ways to achieve those goals as well. That all falls under purpose. Um, as for pain points, uh, remember that this is pain points about your end users, not necessarily the pain points of your application. So um, an issue with a sustainability app is maybe your users aren't getting the right information that they want for recycling resources. Um, maybe if you're trying to develop some kind of composting like smart app, they are unsure of what's accessible via compost or what you'd have to go outside of your household to recycle. Um, all of those different points are things you can address. And um, lastly, for demographic and accessibility, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, again, your application depends on, depends on what you wanna do. If you wanna to cater towards a younger generation, your design's gonna look different than if you're catering towards a more elderly population. Um, also, with terms to accessibility, you wanna take, um, take into, uh, keep in mind how your users may or may not have accessibility to certain types of transportation, um, any logistical issues, um, as well as um, any general accessibility pro problems that Tiffany also went over. Um, so all good things to keep in mind when you're working on your design. Okay, cool. So now we'll go into design critique, which is, um, so we'll revisit the sample prompt that um, Isha talked about. Um, so the prompt is to design a software to help Americans be less wasteful. Um, and so the solutions can come in the form of either like hand-drawn or, um, you know, capability. and we will uh, look at each of the sample like um, designs and then evaluate you know what's good what's bad what can be improved um, from the standpoint of all of the concepts that we discussed earlier in the presentation okay so i'll be talking about the first two designs so in the first design we have a screen for sustainable takeout and also a second screen in this app to search for sustainable farmers markets so you can see that 
in the, the first screen draws inspiration from something like a food delivery service, where there's a list where users can search for sustainable restaurants. So one main improvement that we thought about here that can be made with this design is consolidating both of these tasks into a single screen um, and having the ability to search for restaurants through a map view to make the experience simpler. Okay, and, and then in the second design, we have a screen to search for sustainable activities like the disposal of clothes and another screen for tracking the average waste created by a user. So one issue um, is that a pain point that users often have trouble with is knowing where to start or knowing what to do to attain sustainable living, as we talked about before. And this app is only usable for those that are already knowledgeable. So because our target, target audience includes those who are trying to begin living sustainably, this interface should incorporate more of a guiding factor to show them how. Okay, cool. Um, so for the third design, um, you can see on the left side, um, the middle screen has um, is able to monitor progress. Like it shows the person how much they've wasted each day um, and it's kind of there to track that. And then on the right hand side, there's a couple of screens that um, show like an option to search for posts and save relevant posts. Um, one thing to notice about this particular design is that it references a lot of like popular apps, like, you know, fitness tracking apps or like um, Instagram, the right, the, the design on the right hand side, like definitely resembles Instagram. Um, one thing that could be improved about the way this app works is um, a lot of like audiences who may be using this app might prefer to find their content on like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, so instead of just having safe posts within the app, um, the, uh, the software could work such that, you know, you can find posts on other social media and then save them within this app and then refer to them later. Um, and so this makes the app a lot more usable and then people will be more encouraged to um, like use it more often. Um, okay, so for the fourth design um, on the left side, um, there's a screen that you can like scan something before you throw it away to see if there's some better options. Um, and then on the right hand side, the screen that shows up once you scan something um, shows you like some properties of whatever you scanned. Um, and then it also has two options. You can either find some ideas on how to reuse it or you can um, like go back and search for another. Um, so one thing to observe here is um, a big factor in uh, designing like a tech product for like that's usable is like the number of clicks that you have to use to like attain a certain result. Um, so one thing that we could do with this existing design to minimize click, uh, clicks and simplify user uh, flow is on second screen, um, like if the recyclable paper, 30% reuse, like environment friendly, if those are like um, made a bit smaller and put as like tags at the top, then the reuse ideas could be listed on the screen itself without having to like click a button to see those. Um, and then the search another, um, because it doesn't actually add to the content of the page um, and it's not really like relevant content wise, it's just like a navigation feature. Um, it can just be put as a back button on either the top or bottom. Um, yeah, and so like the main takeaway from this design is like minimizing clicks and uh, making um, the app more like flow more easily. All right, so moving on a little bit. So we've covered quite a bit about how to make your UI UX of any tech product that you create much more accessible and with good design principles in mind. But how about if your website or if your product is something that you want to create a landing page for or a website about, it's not the specific product that you're creating. So um, with what we've already gathered ready, so accessibility is super important and these principles are still things that we wanna keep in mind. So making sure that the page is easy to navigate and understand as well as having the text be readable. And then from any landing page you create itself, you want to have the product scope and purpose be easily understood. That's the point of a landing page, right? And any buttons and links you have are clearly visible and link out to the correct pages accordingly. So with also the strategies that we've employed in the previous presentation so far, just the do next slide. 
Yeah, so for example, this is Stripe's website. So Stripe, for anyone who may not know, is a payments processing um, product or software or that developers sometimes integrate into their websites and web applications. So they're known for their APIs. However, since they are a more technical product, they also need a website to accompany it and explain what they're actually doing. So as stated earlier, having their landing page have buttons clearly linked. So you can see that there's high contrast between things like the read the docs button on the left side or the start here button or yeah, on the right side, then we can keep this in mind and see that you know exactly what they do from the start and you can navigate to where you wanna be. And then we can see some more um, examples on the next page as well. So things such as Okta, which is a SSO product, you can see that right away from the first page, the world's number one identity platform. You can see header at the top with all of the relevant different categorizations of things you may want to go towards and different buttons. And it has a nice design language throughout where there's consistent fonts and colors. And then on the right side, you may see something like cruise.com where there's a lot of different information given at once. As soon as you go onto the front page and you're may not necessarily know where you want to go next or really what the different options are, as well as the website itself looking somewhat outdated and tacky. So keeping the other information we had in mind and everything we covered throughout the presentation so far, it's definitely possible for you to design a great product or website. And these are some additional resources for you to um, check out as well. So we mentioned a little bit about the laws of UX or heuristics. So these can go hand in hand to create different products or websites with different principles in mind, such as having it have less choices for users to make to limit their cognitive load. Or additionally, websites such as Dribbble, where you can check out the different designs and portfolios of people out in industry and see what is out there so you can gain inspiration about how they do things, as well as just navigating towards or um, taking a look at a deeper look into the different products that you use on a daily basis that you really enjoy and what you like about it and what you don't like about it. Then also in terms of accessibility itself, there are a lot of different online tools out there that you can use to help you make sure that you have alternative texts on all of your different images, as well as high contrast. Um, so there's Totally, Axe, Lighthouse, and Ace, for example. However, I'd say that you should use these with caution due to the fact that things may pass these online accessibility audits, however, be actually inaccessible. So also have, Thing, users test through what you're doing is super important with any product that you create, especially in terms of determine product market fit and um, if users would actually want to um, use your product as well as navigate through it effectively and do exactly what you want it to do. And yeah, without further ado, um, we are going to open it up for any questions you guys may have and thanks for listening to the, our presentation so far. Hi, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or drop them in the chat. Okay. Um, it seems like there aren't any questions right now. Oh, there's one in the chat. Um, they asked, how can we incorporate universal design while making our product? Yeah, so things such as universal design are super important to include in your product. So a lot of times when we think about 
making things as easy as possible for the majority of users, it might actually end up leaving some users out. So a case study or a case example is if the majority of users may identify as white race-wise, that doesn't necessarily mean that the automatic default for the question of race should be that someone is white or the same thing with gender, sex, anything like that, because then that imposes a narrative of what the default really is. So in terms of creating things to be more universal, I'd say using inclusive language for sure is super important, making it so that you're not putting in different gender languages, um, instead using they pronouns if you're unsure about someone's gender or doing things like referring to people um, with disabilities as people with disabilities rather than um, being marked by whatever their disability is. And then there's additional guidance I'd put there as well. So testing it with different audiences is super important in terms of making sure that um, your product is something that's viable, but also to make sure that any assumptions that you're making um, or are actually being tested. And um, I would also qualify doing user research as being super important before creating whatever products you're making, just so that you can understand the underlying pain points and insights from um, users before you actually go towards um, making a full-scale product and then realizing that um, you made assumptions. That's a little bit there. I can also answer any follow-ups or if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to ask them as well. Yeah, also just wanted to like thank everybody for coming to the workshop. Um, if you want to learn more about Hack for Impact, you can visit our website or even connect with us on Instagram. Um, yeah, and if you like have any more questions after this, again, feel free to like put it in the chat and we'll answer it. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much to the Hack for Impact team for hosting the workshop today. I hope everyone took a lot away from it. And as always, you can like reach out to them um, if you have any more questions. Yeah, so um, the next component of FORGE will be the mentoring sessions, which will happen in about 20 minutes. Um, so make sure that you know which mentoring time slots you have. You can check it on the Notion, the event guide. Um, there are like specific Zoom links that you should be joining at specific times, and all of that information is over there. Um, but if you have any questions about that, um, me and Monica are going to be in this main room the whole time. Um, so you can always come here and ask us if you have any questions about like logistics or anything like that. Um, but yeah, otherwise, thank you so much. Um, Hack for Impact. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye.